You are listening to the Music Ed Mentor Podcast, where we help music educators to build, manage, and grow thriving school music programs and have long and happy careers. I am your host, Elisa Jansen Jones, and I couldn't be more thrilled that you are joining me today to share a bit of time to help your own life. And today, that help comes in the form of something most of us already do teach private lessons. I adore door teaching one-on-one lessons for a lot of reasons, but the main ones are it has helped improve my teaching skills massively since I've had to craft specific instruction for a wide variety of students. I've learned how to push the faster students along and keep the slower ones going at a solid pace. I've learned many, many different ways of teaching the same thing, the same concepts, but to different types of learners. I like to think of my private lesson studio as my test kitchen for teaching techniques. And since I've been doing it for so long, I'd like to think it's helped me gain an impressive list of tools. I also like that I can schedule lessons when I want to teach them. And if something comes up, I can reschedule or cancel without having to find a sub. I love that I can teach in my home so I can go from helping my kids with their homework to teaching a lesson and to making dinner all without lost time and travel. I like that I almost always have students calling me, so I can take or leave as many as I want, and it's a great way to make some quick, easy cash when I'm having a bit of a slow month. Now, you don't have to do it as casually as I do. Certainly, if you dedicated yourself, you could have your own lesson room and a music store or find a place to collaborate with other private instructors and create a whole school of music. You could do it part-time and make a full-time salary, depending on what you charge. I love talking about side gigs like this right now because most of us are still at the start of the school year and are maybe realizing we need a little more cash than we thought. And Christmas is coming soon too. So to help us navigate the waters a bit and give us some great advice in the private lessons sector, in case you haven't ever taught private lessons before, or if you're just wanting to grow that part of your career, I've brought in Wendy Brentnall Wood author of the book, Music School Success. She is amazing and you're gonna love the advice that she gives. We'll share ideas for how to recruit your ideal students, whether they're school-aged kiddos or adults looking to learn a new skill, how to stay organized and make sure you get paid, how to structure yourself that it's all legal and you don't find yourself getting audited by the IRS, and many other questions that you probably have. But first, if you're looking for a great organizational and practice tracking tool, have you ever looked at Tonara? Tonara creates an inspiring community for music teachers and students throughout the week. They know the apps don't teach quality music, teachers do. And Tonara can make your teaching even more engaging. Help your students discover the difference effective practice can make. Tonara is available on mobile, tablet, and desktop. So head to tonara.com and sign up for a 30-day free trial or head to your respective mobile store on your device and download the app. Then Tonara can help you create happiness in your private lesson studio today. And of course, this podcast is brought to you by Smart Music. With more than 95 plus method books, 5,400 ensemble titles, and thousands of solos from top publishers, and the ability to create your own worksheets, repertoire, and sight reading exercises, there's no wonder that Smart Music was voted one of SBO Magazine's Best Tools for Schools in 2019. And remember to sign your students up for the Virtual Honor Band, brought to you by Smart Music and the International Music Education Summit. Give your students a chance to shine and free access to Smart Music's awesome tools too. Go to musiceducationsummit.org slash audition dash information to learn how to get your band kiddos involved in this unique opportunity. Now, let's talk about how you can streamline and grow your private lessons. Hello, I'm Wendy Brentnell Wood and I'm from Melbourne, Australia. I'm a music teacher, entrepreneur of over 40 years experience. Really privileged to be on Alyssa's podcast today. Yeah, and most of us do both, at least all of, you know, the, the majority of my listeners will be classroom teachers, but do some type of private lessons or studio work on the side as well. So for us, it's, it's sometimes an important side gig and let's not pass over the, 
the potential for more money as well, right? Absolutely. And I think that's why when I first went into the classroom, I didn't stop teaching privately just because I finished my degree. I had students. I wanted to keep seeing them develop, but also the income was really helpful, you know, setting up a home and having a family. Those extra dollars make a, a huge difference to you for sure. But it also gives you a whole different skill set, doesn't it, from teaching in the classroom to teaching individuals and, and developing that one-on-one -on -one relationship. And some people really find that that's where they, they really want to be rather than in front of the big school classroom. But here in Australia, we can also do what we would call private teaching, but in a school setting. So we have a lot of people who go into particularly primary schools and they'll teach their instrumental classes or their singing classes to small groups or individual students there. And then they'll go home and they'll teach at home as well or in the students' homes as well. So there really is lots of flexibility on, on how you can do that uh, music teaching, for sure. Yeah, I when I first graduated from university, I took a teaching job in a school. I opened a brand new school. It was totally my dream job teaching band and orchestra to seventh, eighth and ninth grade students, right? And I just, yep. I loved it. I still remember really clearly one day when a student raised their hand to ask a question and we were just right in the middle of rehearsing music, right? So I stopped everything to answer this question and she goes, Mrs. Jones, what's your dream job? And I said, this, <laughs> This is, this is my dream job. This is, I'm totally doing it. And they looked at me like I was insane, but I was like, no, this is totally it. So what could possibly take me away from my dream job, right? It was my children yeah. because I yep. discovered I couldn't be the kind of mother I wanted to be and the kind of teacher I wanted to be. And that's just me personally. I know some wonderful mothers who are also teachers full time and they are, are wonderful people. I am not that wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so I quit, quit my teaching job to stay home with my uh, little kids, but that didn't stop me from teaching lessons. So exactly the problem that I had though, and maybe you can help us kind of flesh this out is I wasn't established. Like some people knew me, but most people just knew me as, as the teacher from, you know, way in, in, a, in another town. So I worked in a different town from where I lived. So I needed to start recruiting students from, from where I was, but so many of the local, I was, it was, there were two universities in the town, so they had a lot of private teachers already and established studios, and all of those, the, the teachers in that area, the school teachers who would re be referring students to a private studio like mine, they already had their favorite established teachers. So even though I was primarily a French horn player, I would have been competing with my best friend who has now written a book on French horn playing, right? Or my former right. horn teachers. And so I needed to find a niche, right? Yeah, I could, exactly. I couldn't just be the, the horn teacher because everybody else was already these wonderfully established horn teachers. So can we talk really quickly about how you kind of find a, a niche in your private studio space? Absolutely. No, it's it's absolutely important and it's it's often overlooked by most people. Uh, if, you, if you ask private music teachers what's their biggest challenge, then usually one of the top things that comes back is I don't have enough students or I don't have enough income. How do I find more students? And they think it's all about spending money, spending time on advertising and marketing. And yes, that is really important, but if you haven't worked out what your particular unique teaching factor is or your brand, as it's often called in, in most marketing terms, if you don't know what that is that makes you unique, unique and is niche, then whatever money and time you spend on your advertising and marketing is often just going to be you know, out there and floating around and not hitting the right targets. So you need to, first of all, decide what that uniqueness is and then you need to broadcast that out to the community to attract the, the students to you as a teacher 
that are the ones who are most likely to be your dream students and to stick around with you long term. The last thing you want to do is spend a lot of time and money recruiting students only to find that they're, they're not actually a good fit for you. Mm-hmm. So it's really, really important. So that's the first thing. Figure out that unique niche. And I think there's a, a bit of a checklist you can go through first of all. Uh, things like what age groups are you comfortable teaching? So do you want to teach preschoolers? Do you want to teach primary school or juniors? Do you want to teach the secondary school, teenage level? Do you want to teach adults? Do you want to teach seniors? Quite different skill sets for the different age groups. And some people aren't comfortable teaching preschoolers or they really don't have the right skills at this point or they don't like dealing with teenagers. They prefer to deal with the juniors. So that's the first thing. Think about the the age group that you'd like to teach. Yeah, that's brilliant. Brilliant. Love it. There's also things like um, what style of music? I mean, it's a fairly obvious one. You might say, I only want to teach people who are interested in classical music. So if they came along and said, I wanted to play jazz, French horn, would you be able to do it? If not, then they're not your dream students. So you need to think about what styles of music you want to be able to teach, and that can become part of your marketing. I'm a classical French horn teacher. It doesn't say I want to teach you jazz or I want to teach you pop. <laughs> That's just one random, you know, example because you said you teach French horn. No, it's it's perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, not that common. Then there's other things like do you want to teach only individual students? So what sort of programs are you going to offer? Small groups, ensembles, bands. Uh, what is it that you offer in terms of programs? How long are your lessons? Go through all the different logistics of how you feel you want to teach, what it is you can offer. And then you can put together a little bit of a profile on your dream student. So it might be that your dream student is a primary school child, so someone between the age of five and, say, 12 years of age. Um, It might be that you only want to teach classical music. So someone who wants to do classical music perhaps wants to go through the exam system and that type of thing and you want them to be able to have group lessons for their first two years and then they move into individual classes. So that's how you've designed your program. So you've got this little picture of who it is that you want to teach and then you can describe that and describe how you're going to give them an experience that matches what they're after and then that will translate into your advertising and marketing. Does that all make sense? Oh, perfect. Perfect sense. I love that you started with with what do you as a teacher want to do because otherwise you're not going to enjoy it or want to stick with it, right? Oh, absolutely. And, And look, some of us who are multi-instrumentalists because I've taught numerous instruments over the years can stretch ourselves too thinly and it's very difficult to put anybody in the situation where they don't feel confident in their teaching because they're not going to do it well they're going to be stressed and they're not going to be a long-term proposition as a teacher so you don't want to put anyone into that situation and that includes yourself Mm -hmm. so sometimes you can give yourself, give of yourself too much and that can be because you're thinking, oh, I could help this student for a few years perhaps. So be really clear on what you want to do but also what you're good at. So don't put yourself out there too broadly and then come a cropper because of that. Uh, it's really important for the student's sake as well that you don't, say you can teach something that you really can't. So my niche ended up being families, because I could teach so many things. And so I ended up saying, you know, why, why take your students to two teachers when you can just take them to one? Yes, just bring them to my house, and you get to leave them for an hour instead of half an hour and running around town. I could teach your clarinet student and your flute student, I could teach your horn student and your trombone student. I can, you know, yes. and so 
So that that was one of my niches. And then I thought, who are the students that aren't successful with other teachers? And so I ended up with homeschooled students and students with disabilities. That became my, those were my niches. Families who didn't want to take their kids to to separate teachers and families who uh, the students had struggled with other teachers. They came to me. Absolutely. So you've actually got several niches there, which is brilliant. I am looking in my town now at what is not being taught by anybody else. Because I'm in a little bit smaller town now than I was. And I'm Mm -hmm. looking at like ukulele. There's only one other ukulele teacher in town and I can teach ukulele. And there's not a lot of voice teachers in town. And gosh, I'm a professionally trained vocalist. So so that wow. those are what I'm going to do. And um, I might even start. So then you said, do what you really want to do. Yes. I really want to start like a ukulele ensemble. That does. Fantastic. So anyway, you're saying all the all the right stuff, all the right stuff. <laughs> when do we go and maybe we should hop into some of the logistics because yep. I feel like most of us just take the money and put it in our bank account and forget that the government probably wants a cut <laughs> of that. And maybe we should have some kind of more formalized system. So can we just talk about some of the, the business logistics that are that we should be doing to be legitimate? Absolutely. Unfortunately, it's one of those things that musicians and music teachers don't get much education in as they're coming up through uh, the education system. It's changing a little bit these days, but often it's self-education, which is an add-on. So people have to know that they need it and they don't necessarily know that until they've come a cropper, if that makes sense. So I've actually been running my music education companies for almost 40 years now. And in that time, I've been teaching not just in classroom and not just privately, but I've employed and subcontracted often over 30 teachers at a time. And we've worked with schools and we've worked with kindergartens and we've worked with um, private individuals in all different sorts of formats. I've even franchised the business at one stage as well. So in doing all of those things, and the reason I mention it is that I had to build some systems to help me keep on track with everything to avoid repeating problems that would happen when I didn't know what I was doing business-wise. Because a lot of it was trial and error for me when we were talking 30 years ago and there was no business education for music teachers around. It was all trial and error. Yeah, there still isn't. Not, Not here, there's not. Well, unfortunately, it, it seems to be the thing that misses, misses out with music teachers. It's all about being a great teacher and building a, a great curriculum and all of the skills of being a teacher, except how to look after the business side. So that's actually one of the things that I'm now doing a lot with music teachers is coaching them one-on-one, putting together some online courses and uh did I tell you I've written a book for music teachers as well? <laughs> so please do. <laughs> look, I've even got an, a, a copy here I can show you. <laughs> so it's just about to be released, and it's aimed to fill a bit of that gap about um, how to run your music teaching um, business as a professional business, not a hobby. So getting back to your original question. What I've found over the years of doing all of this is that there's eight different parts of your business that you need to be considering at all times. There will be a different amount of attention required for each of those eight areas depending on where you're at with your development and the size of your uh, teaching studio. But there are eight different parts. So I like to go through them in, in order of, Finance is the first one that is most obvious. Then you've got the intellectual property, which is often known as IP. That one confuses a lot of people, but essentially it's it's to do with anything that you create yourself. 
might be a, a unique teaching curriculum or it might be actual music that you've written. That would be the things you call your IP and that's really important to protect. Um, there's the legal sides of it, so making sure you've got all the right insurances and registrations and, and you've got the right business structure. Uh, you've got the merchandise part of what you sell to students, and I mean physical products as well as the actual lessons that you teach. The operations is one that most people spend their time on, which is anything to do with the administration and the, and the timetabling and all that sort of thing. Human resources or HR as it's called, which is when you are employing people, subcontracting people, but also you as the teacher, you are a human resource. So how do you look after yourself? How do you pay yourself? How do you, you know, do you give yourself superannuation? Do you give yourself holidays? And any other people in your network that you might utilise to support you as well, that's part of your HR. Then you've got your IT, which is obviously any technology that you're utilising. And these days, there's so much available to you that you want to make sure you're using some good IT. And, of course, the marketing side. So they're the eight different business divisions that I like to try and keep a tab on all the time, uh, no matter where I'm at in the development of my business. So it could be that I'm launching some new area in the business or I could be just travelling on and trying to keep everything at the same level. But you need to keep your finances under control. You need to make sure your IP and your legal are all in the right order. Keep your marketing going. Keep your administration and everything else. Keep it bubbling along and keep your eye on it, essentially. Do you use a lot of automation, like stuff that you don't have to have your hands on, that it's just you set it up and, and it goes? Absolutely. I absolutely adore automation. <laughs> I love it when my email pops up and says, this has been done or, you know, this is coming up and it's like, oh, I don't even have to send myself reminders or scribble notes or anything like that. It's all just coming through the system. So automation is absolutely brilliant for sure but the, the when I say to keep your eye on things it's more about having a system of reviewing things so whether it be finance or marketing or, or whatever other business division that I'm talking about if you have a system where once a week or once a month or once a quarter you sit down and you do a, an overview of what's happened in the last period of time and what's what you're planning to happen in the next period of time then you're not going to have some sudden emergency where something has happened that you're unaware of uh, you'll be able to look at the, the historical data and plan ahead and, and avoid any dramas so speaking of dramas can we talk about risk management and what kinds of challenges we probably are going to to run into, what are some reasons why we maybe wouldn't want to teach private lessons or have a private studio? I guess one of the, the biggest dramas or challenges that uh, private music studio owners have can be the unreliability of the work. So by that I mean that they might have students who start and then stop midterm or, you know, after a few weeks or you know, whatever it might be, so they don't always have a full schedule. And the way I would like to address that is that it, often it comes down to the sort of policies and the sort of program you set up. So are you allowing them too much flexibility and when they can start and stop? Or do you have policies where it says, well, you're, you're basically going to be coming for the next three months or six months or 12 months. That's the program you've signed up for. Uh, that's part of it. The other part of it is actually the motivation and what it is, what experience you're giving them to retain those students as well. So that's usually the biggest uh, negative, I think, is the perhaps unreliability of the um, teaching privately 
But then there's other things like the unsocial hours that you can have. So we often have to teach after school and that's when our own kids might be home uh, or should be home. Uh, you've got evenings, you've got weekends. So for us, that's the prime time to be teaching. And that's usually family time and social time. So it's a real juggle to give yourself the best of both worlds. And balancing that plus balancing income is often a bit tricky. And that's also impacted when it comes to things like school holidays or public holidays, where most students also want to go out and be social, spend time with their family. So you don't have students, so you don't have income. And again, that could be just a matter of rethinking your the way you charge for your lessons and perhaps you charge monthly instead of charging per lesson or perhaps you charge a higher rate to cover those times when you're not teaching. So balancing all of those things out because you know that that is how the teaching time is going to play out. So there's a lot to do with the policies and, and the way you plan out your programs, not just think, well, teacher down the road charges you know, $30, therefore I'm going to charge $30. That might work for them because that's all they need and they only want to do a certain amount of teaching. For you, you might need to do it a different way. So I think they're the biggest negatives. Um, the other big problem besides unreliability or um, that sort of student retention factor is, of course, the, the workload, the um, admin time sometimes that the teachers complain about because they have to do everything themselves. They have to be the, the one-person show. So they're the teacher, they're the administrator, they're the finance person, they're the marketing person, they're the, you know, everything. All of those eight business divisions I mentioned before are something that, the solo music teacher has to look after themselves. So that can take significant time unless, like you said before, you get onto the automation bandwagon and you use technology to do as much as possible. Have a great accounting software package, uh, a software platform that ma manages your bookings and your payments and that sort of thing so you don't have to be chasing things on a manual system or, or having huge spreadsheets that you've got to constantly update. So I think the time and the unreliability are the, are the biggest negatives. But of course there's, there's so many positives. We, you know, that's why why we stick with it and why there's so many people who are music teachers, because there's so many positives, wouldn't you agree? Oh, absolutely. Some of some of the best things that I learned from really focusing on individual lessons was I grew my toolkit. Like I was able to work with individual students to come up with multiple ways to teach a single concept. So when I went back into the classroom years later, I was able to pull those out. I still use them when I, you know, I'm, I'm working with an ensemble even because I was able to work with so many students over those years of so many different ability levels. It just allowed me to, to cast aside almost the stuff I had learned in university and just use the stuff that I knew worked because I'd been doing it one-on-one -on -one with students before. So that was one of my favorite things about it. And then watching those, those students grow. I had one student for four years. And when he started with me, he was an underperforming reader in school. He had a physical disability and couldn't hold his instrument right. He had to have a custom-built instrument because of his his physical disabilities. Mm -hmm. And I got to watch him grow over four years until he went from fourth grade to eighth grade. But I think one of the really cool things about teaching privately is the fact that you have total control over what it is you're going to teach. Because uh, sometimes in the school systems, particularly in a classroom program, you're given a curriculum and said, well, this is what you have to achieve this by the end of you know the term or the year or whatever, and you, that's your curriculum, you stick to that. And particularly if you're in a big team of teachers at a big school, 
you know, you have to keep to your area for your lessons. When you're teaching individual students or even small group students privately, you can not only uh, choose what you think is going to be a workable curriculum, but you can individualise it to the student uh, so that you get the best outcomes for them. You can motivate them to do the stuff that they really want to do. And that's a huge part of student retention is, is getting the students motivated with stuff that they love and making it achievable and easy and fun and all that. And that for a teacher is just an amazing sensation to have that impact with a student and see them light up when they achieve something and see them excited to share it with their family. And I think that's one of the biggest positives that you can have for being any sort of teacher, but specifically a music teacher. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Can we go back to some marketing stuff? Because yes. I, I think you're right about, you know, we need to not only have a solid message and, and get that out there. And um, the term I like to use is a unique selling proposition yep. for USP, right? Yep. Um, but, but. I noticed in, you know, our notes that you said, don't stick all your eggs in one basket. <laughs> Can you talk to us about, about that? Absolutely. Um, that term is basically saying, don't just do one thing, do many things. So when it comes to marketing for your music teaching, you don't want to just try and do one ad in your local newspaper or one ad on Facebook and think that that's going to be the be all and end all. Not everybody is going to be looking at that particular thing, that particular newspaper or Facebook. So, for example, how many people do you know who never go on Facebook, who don't go on Facebook at all? Do you know anybody, Elisa? Yeah, I know lots of people who don't do Facebook at all. Exactly. So if you were to spend all your advertising on Facebook ads and all your time building up your profile on Facebook, then you're missing out on a certain number of people who don't go on Facebook. So the dead opposite of that, of course, being social media, would be any sort of printed newsletters, posters, newspapers, um, things that might be school newsletters, and any printed media. If you were only to use those, you might miss out on the people who just spend all their time on social media. So they're two quite different types of marketing avenues uh, that I would suggest you explore both types. Even further, you get down to the nitty-gritty of offline, offline and online, but you get into the local community. What is there in the local community? Where are the areas where you can start to get known? And the first point is usually any local schools. So if you're a parent yourself, and this is partly how I started teaching uh, instrumental music in primary schools, was that I had children going to school at five years of age. I got known as being a music teacher who had children at the school. The other parents started to ask me, could I teach their, their children as well? And then the school got to know that I was teaching uh, kids from the school. So I got asked to come to the school to take the lessons at the school as well. So getting the word out amongst the people that you know that you are doing this, you are teaching French horn, you're teaching ukulele, you're teaching singing. Um, and that can be word of mouth. That can be a school newsletter. That could be sponsoring some school event under your business name. It could be putting a sign on the side of your car. It could be putting a sign in your front garden. Lots of different ways to get the word out so that you're not missing out on a chunk of people who really need and want what you offer um, and also broadening the number of people that you can impact on. So definitely never stick all your eggs in one basket. So in any sort of business, not just music schools, there is a, a sort of standard evolution 
going from what's often called a, a startup business through to an established business. Uh, and it can take anything from a small amount of time, uh, like a year, to many years, just depending on the type of business and the size of the business. But essentially, it is a cycle that you can go through if you wish to keep developing and growing your business. So just to point people back again in case they've forgotten, I've just put out and launched a book and this is... (laughs) (laughs) I love it. Self-promotion is totally welcome here. Hit it. (laughs) (laughs) So in the book, I, I go through what I call the seven evolution steps. And so, again, there's a few steps that people tend to overlook when they decide that they want to start up uh, as a music teacher. It's the first couple of steps that can really make a huge difference in the short and the long-term outcome. So the first one is actually one that I call prepare. And in the prepare time, it's when you basically audit what resources you've got to set up your your business. So what time have you got? What money have you got? What equipment have you got? Uh, What sort of a network of support people have you got? And so forth. So you, you sit down and you work out what are all these resources that I've got available to help me to build my music school. And then once you've done that, that's when the real fun starts because then you start to do the dreaming section. And what I always suggest to people is dream big, dream wild, dream crazy. If there were no restrictions on you whatsoever, what would your music school look like? Would it be multiple locations? Would it be hundreds of teachers or hundreds of students and, you know, every instrument under the sun and every sort of ensemble and multiple performance opportunities? What would it look like? And paint big dreams. And then once you've really mulled that over and figured out what you really, truly, deeply want and what your first thoughts in your dreams may not end up being the reality of what you feel comfortable with if you mull it over for a time and you let it sit in the back of your mind and you explore and research what other people are doing and what other opportunities are out there, it may change over a week or two or a month or two. But once you've truly found the ideal dream of what your music school wants to be, then the next step is to sit down and design exactly what that looks like. So designing it in terms of the the nitty-gritty of what will classes look like, how many students will I take, how long will lessons be, uh, how much will I charge, where will I take these classes? How many people will I need to help me? And so on and so forth. And once you've designed it all, then you get into the real fun stuff of you actually start to build it. So the building phase is when you take your design and you take the action on it and you start to put together your technology platforms and get the resources and book the venue and source the teachers and all that sort of thing. And once you've built it, of course, you've got to live the dream for a while. And whilst you're living the dream, it means you're actually doing the teaching and running the programs and tweaking and testing and making sure everything is working the way you hoped it should work. Because chances are your dream and your design and your build may not have quite achieved 100% spot on in everything that you've tried to achieve. So you just have to tweak and test and then continue on towards that dream. Once, you, once you're in that process of living it, you also need to be sharing that dream. So getting your students into the community, getting the families involved and sharing with your community the music that's being made. And then you get back to the point of, okay, I've got all of this amazing music stuff happening and there's fantastic music school and students and teachers and so on, I'm ready now to expand, preparing and auditing your resources 
dreaming about what the expansion will be be like, designing it, building it, living it, sharing it, and off you go again. So it really is an evolutionary cycle. Yeah, I love that that specific direction because I feel like in each of those steps we can get so caught or so bogged down and we don't know what the next step is. So, you know, we might just jump into it thinking, I just need a few extra dollars after school every day, or I just need to, you know, build up my teaching chops or, well, I want to be home with my kids, so I may as well teach a few lessons. But really having that vision is so incredibly essential. Otherwise, the students will show up and you won't have the passion for teaching them anymore. So... I love that you address each of those steps, um, including sharing it and expanding it. So that's amazing. Thanks. Yeah, it's one of those things that has just come out of doing lots of different music schools in lots of different formats. So having retail music schools and school programs and employing teachers in different ways, it, it became something that you could use to replicate and just keep moving forward without having to constantly reinvent the wheel. I love it. Well, Wendy, this has just been an amazing and enlightening journey with you over these last few minutes. Tell, tell us where we can get your book and how we could book a session with you if we, if we need that one-on-one kind of help. Sure. Look, if you go to my website, which is www.wendysmusic.com, you'll find that uh, there's a lot of different things in terms of resources available for music teachers there. I've got a blog which has got webinars and resources that people can download. Uh, There's also a page specifically about the book, so uh, it would be wendysmusic.com.au forward slash books, and that will give you all the information about the book and the different places it's available. So if you're in Australia, you can order it directly from the website. Um, We're also having it launched on Amazon very soon. Uh, That should be in the next couple of weeks. So hopefully by mid-end of September, it'll be up on Amazon so you can get digital copy. Uh, There's an audio copy available. So lots of different ways you can get your hands on it. And if anybody's ever stuck, they can always shoot me an email through the website as well. And to get the free strategy session, also available through the website. Fantastic. And I will have all of those links in the show notes for this episode as well. So thank you so much for your time and your expertise and everything that you've given us today. It's been an absolute pleasure. I have to admit, that after recording this episode and listening to it back and edit, I was more encouraged than ever to start teaching more private lessons. It really is such a boon in the community and something that all music programs need to help those kids who need it, which in turn helps the students in the classroom and helps the teachers and that helps the programs and that helps community at large. Wendy just makes it so easy. If you'd like to learn more about her book or sign up for a free 30-minute strategy session with her, visit the show notes for this episode, which you will find at smartmusic.com slash blog and search for episode 60. While you're there, I would absolutely love it. It would make my year if you'd fill out the listener survey, help guide the type of content we bring to you in this podcast. Thanks again to Tanara for sponsoring this episode and for Smart Music for making this podcast happen and for all the great ways that they help support music educators in the classroom and the studio. Thank you for listening and sharing this time with me. I invite you to subscribe and leave us a quick five-star rating so that other music educators can find the Music Ed Mentor Podcast and learn too. Until next time, my friend, keep teaching on.